Hello, friends, and welcome back to the PrepWell podcast. In this week's episode, I want to bring up an issue that I think we all know is happening, but we may not know how quickly it's happening or how devastating its results may be, especially for our children. The issue is the seeming lack of challenges that our children are facing today. And I know that might sound crazy, because many of our children appear to be, on the surface at least, overwhelmed, overscheduled, and stressed out a lot of the time, especially as they move deeper and deeper into high school. How could I possibly say that students aren't being challenged? They're so busy. Or are they? And what types of challenges are they facing? How do they differ from past challenges? And what exactly are they so busy with? Now, I'm not suggesting that students don't have any challenges to deal with. After all, life is essentially a series of daily, weekly, monthly challenges that we have to overcome, but they don't seem to be the same types of challenges that we had 20 or 30 years ago. The challenges are different, and I'm not sure they're better. In fact, there's mounting evidence that they could be far worse. Part of this debate centers around whether or not life has become too easy for students. And if this is driven by technology and innovation and efficiency, is that a good thing or a bad thing? If time-saving technology is adding a few hours back into every week, how are students using that, quote, extra time? If I had to guess, swiping on social media and playing video games would be the likely candidates. What happened to doing hard things? Without having to face these everyday challenges, as annoying and frustrating as they may be, how well equipped will our kids be for the real world? Apparently not very. Depression, suicide, dropout rates, listlessness, lack of purpose disengagement, giving up, all of these trends are on the rise, not the decline. Let's do a quick survey of what's gotten a lot easier over the last 20 or 25 years. How much effort does it take these days to connect with a friend or with friends? Maybe two seconds, three seconds? You'll immediately know where your friends are, who they're with, whether they're online or not, Poof! Without even calling or texting them, you know what they're up to. You didn't have to remember their phone number, call and get a busy signal, call their house and get a voicemail and wait for them to return your call. You didn't have to call and speak to their scary father or mother. You don't have to call and have their phone ring off the hook for 10 minutes if nobody was home. If you weren't at home, There's no way to call your friend unless you remember to bring some change to make a call from a phone booth. Think of all the friction that has been eliminated from the system. The challenge quotient went from a 7 out of 10 to connect with friends to a 0 out of 10, totally seamless. Where's the challenge in that? What about the study environment these days? This is something that I harp on in the weekly videos inside Prepwell Academy. Does anyone sit at a desk anymore? Does anyone sit in an uncomfortable desk chair anymore? When studying for bio or chemistry or writing a short story for English? Does anyone have a pen or a pencil out? Or a scrap of paper to take notes? Or to figure out a problem? Or work out a schematic of some kind? Of course not. Kids study on their beds, upside down and backwards, phone in their hand, staring at the ceiling, laptop casually placed face down on the pillow, or they, quote, study at Starbucks with a latte in their hand and a pumpkin spice muffin and their Bose headphones on, listening to music while they're, quote, unquote, studying. Where's the challenge in that? Once your child starts driving, how hard is it for them to find their way to another school 
or a football field, or a friend's house, or a job location? Do they have to crack open a Thomas Brothers map and first find out where they are now and then find out where they're supposed to go and then map themselves with the best route and actually pay attention to streets and bridges and overpasses, maybe even have to memorize what exit to get off? Or do they simply type the address into Google Maps and wait for the second-by-second, turn-by-turn directions being called out to them in their preferred accent, by the way, from their phone, without knowing if they'll even be in the same state when they reach their destination. They have no idea. They barely even know where they are on a map, and they for sure have no idea where they're ending up. They just do what they're told, and they poof, they arrive. And if this is too much to handle, then they click a button, they call the Uber, They sit in the back of the Uber on their phone until the car comes to a complete stop, at which point they get out of the car. The old school way, with the Thomas Brothers map, for example, students were forced to have some idea of where they are, what the main highways are, the bodies of water, the names of towns and cities and boundaries. None of this happens anymore. Where's the challenge in that? How hard is it to find entertainment these days? Back in the day, the choices were somewhat limited. Maybe go to a movie at the Cineplex, or rent a movie from Blockbuster, go to a friend's house, a ball game, maybe mini golf. That was about it. And it took some effort to look up showtimes in the newspaper and find directions and get everyone on the same page. Who's going to pick who up? It took effort and planning and logistics, maybe even checking in with your parents. And by the way, you were taking your chances as to whether the movie was even worth it. Lots of times the movie was a total dud and you spent good money and time on a wasted evening. That doesn't happen anymore. Teenagers immediately know what's good or bad. Thanks to the crowdsourcing of feedback on different apps. Today, the time it takes for a group of teens to come up with a foolproof plan for their nightly activities is measured in seconds. And oftentimes they get real-time intel on which party is popping off and which is not, and they change course. They don't take their chances going to a movie that hasn't been pre-screened and reviewed by a hundred of their peers. They've seen reviews. They've seen previews, they've seen coming attractions, they've seen memes, they've seen underground video footage ahead of time. Where's the challenge in that? What about doing math, multiplying, dividing, adding numbers? Zero time and effort these days. Just ask Siri. Where's the challenge in that? What about getting food? Are you going to take the time and the effort to look up the number of a pizza place and order a few pies and then drive over there and pick it up and bring it back home? I don't think so. They're going to order online. They're going to have a door dash to their front door and they're in business without a moment of wasted time. Where's the challenge in that? What about something as traditional as riding a bike, actually pedaling a bicycle under your own power? Are you kidding me? That's so 2020. Have you heard of e-bikes and one wheels and motorized skateboards and bird scooters? Why would anyone want to expend any energy when you can just stand there or sit there and be transported to where you want to go? Where's the challenge in that? How about reading a book these days? Pretty basic activity that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. I don't think so. Reading is so 2015, with books on tape, with Sparks Notes online, and the internet teeming with thousands of free quote unquote summaries and pre written book reports on East of Eden and Fahrenheit 451, A Brave New World, and the rest. Why spend another minute actually holding a book in your hand and moving your eyeballs across the page? Why waste your precious time when you can get the gist of it from some other kid's notes? 
Where's the challenge in that? What about sizing up a new acquaintance? Maybe a new kid in school or a transfer student. Do you spend a few months getting to know that person in a range of different settings? From gym class to homeroom to a math class, maybe out at a party, at church, at some other community event? Nah. Why wait so long to make a judgment about this person? A quick look at their social media profile will tell you all you need to know. They're either cool or they're not cool. You'll know within seconds. Where's the challenge in that? What about the old-fashioned study strategy of creating flashcards? You remember asking your mom or dad to go out and buy you a 500-pack of index cards? And you would spend a few weeks writing down vocab words on one side and the definitions on the back. The act itself of writing and thinking and looking up and physically handling those cards and flipping them over are what helped you imprint the information in your brain. Well, ask your child the last time that they personally created their own flashcards with physical index cards. They'll look at you like you're crazy and wonder why you would waste so much time and paper and probably say something along the lines of, yeah, mom, we call it Quizlet. Thanks for the suggestion, though. Someone's already done all of that. Where's the challenge in that? Remember back 20, 25 years ago when students would actually have a pen or a pencil in their hand and take notes in class when the teacher was presenting material. Yeah, that doesn't happen anymore. For one, you'd be hard-pressed to find a teenager with any type of writing instrument. Do you have a pen? Uh, no, no one uses pens. How about a notebook? Uh, no again, I use this, and they point to their laptop or their iPad. Most students are digital only. Not because they take notes on it necessarily, or they find it super efficient or easier to manage on their computers, but because they don't have to do anything. They just point and say, yeah, it's all on my computer. And what, as a parent, what are you supposed to say to that? And some teachers aren't exactly promoting the practice of individual note-taking. I hear many cases where teachers actually provide class notes to all of their students on their own lectures. Teachers actually take notes on their own classes and provide those notes for the students online. Apparently, taking your own notes during class has gone out of style. Where's the challenge in that? What about sweeping the floor at home? No thanks, we'll let the Roomba take care of that. What about doing chores around the house? Nope, too busy. I've got schoolwork, I've got sports. Need to fix something around the house? Don't ask your son or daughter. It could take weeks before their calendar opens up for any type of a household project. May as well do it yourself or schedule somebody from Angie's list. Why put in your time in the weight room, working out, lifting, and at the dinner table, eating good food, when it's a lot quicker and easier to test out Vinny's little testosterone or HGH pill? There's even a website that essentially writes your college essays for you. You enter a few highlights and activities about your life into a couple of boxes, you answer a few questions from a drop-down menu, and voila, it spits out an essay that's about 80% complete, along with all of the generic platitudes and tired transitions and yawner conclusions that you could ever dream of. And this list could go on and on and on. I'm only stopping now in the interest of time. Each one of these examples is taking away yet another challenge. Now, lest I oversell the case, not all of these newfangled approaches to life are bad, per se. Efficiency certainly has its place. But what happens when our kids are faced with challenges that can't be resolved with a few keystrokes, or a Google search, or a text message, or a few swipes? A homework assignment that can't be completed in 10 to 15 minutes. A problem set whose solutions can't be found on the web 
within 10 or 15 minutes. A book that doesn't have a one-page summary that you can brush up on 10 or 15 minutes before class. Then what? What happens is you get a whole generation of students who will fail the majority, if not all, of their AP exams. They'll get ones, twos, and threes. I know many students who've taken six, seven, sometimes 10 or more AP classes and gotten A's in the classroom, but they haven't passed any of the final exams. Since when is this a thing? They'll get mediocre scores on their SAT or ACT tests if they take it at all. Why is this such an issue? Because during these tests, they're being challenged to think on their own, with no phone nearby, for an extended period of time. And all they have in front of them is a pencil and a blank test booklet. And they are beyond lost. And they're woefully unprepared. I have students who, from what I can tell, quite literally, appear to be physically incapable of working on their college essay for more than a few minutes at a time, maybe 15 to 20 minutes of attention before it seems like they tap out, they grab their phone for a study break, and that's it. The ability to sit and think and read and reflect and revise, and outline, and rewrite. Where has that gone? These days, it seems almost inconceivable to expect a high school student to put in three to four hours of uninterrupted, deep thought on a Saturday or a Sunday. Now, many of you might be thinking, but Phil, My daughter or son, they're up till 1 a.m. most nights working on homework. They're slammed. This may be true, and maybe your child is an exception, but I would also consider how much of their time is being dedicated to actual work versus interrupted work. How many of those minutes are being taken up by chatting, swiping through Instagram, staring at TikTok, watching Netflix, playing video games? Are they really working on their homework until 1 a.m.? Or are they being distracted all along by any or all of the above? When's the last time you walked down the aisle of an airplane? What are the majority of the young kids doing? Playing some insidious game on their phone with buzzers and lights and bleeps and colors and flashing high score signs. It's comical. Now, don't get me wrong. I know why they're getting distracted. I know it's not easy to put down the phone. I know the type of content that is available on their phones. I don't even like social media, and I get sucked into the vortex for 10 or 15 minutes. It's very easy to do, and that's if you're mature and disciplined. What if you're not? Imagine how much time a teenager burns up going down these different rabbit holes. I've had students submit essay drafts to me that I've asked them to spend at least three hours on, and it looks like they've spent 15 minutes on it. There's no way that what I see is the best a student can produce in three hours. And if it is, and the student really spent three uninterrupted hours, then we have even bigger problems, because then it's more than just an attention issue. It's a skill and a competence issue. It's one thing for parents who've already learned how to overcome some of the old school challenges I referenced above to use these technologies to make their lives a bit easier or more streamlined. They've already learned how to be resourceful and resilient and skilled. They've learned how to focus and fail and regroup. It's quite another thing for kids who've never experienced these challenges to begin with, to immediately adopt all of these time-saving workarounds. They're not getting the benefit of the challenges and the resilience and the skills that such challenges bring about. And any time-saving efficiencies gained are being frittered away on social media swiping and consumption of other people's 
content. Is it possible that all of these technological advances, especially as they relate to information dissemination over the internet and the rise of social media, are creating students that are less prepared, less resilient, less skilled, less competent, and less able to focus intently on one academic task without a phone in their reach? Whether that's studying for an AP exam, working through a physics problem set, writing a college essay. And we wonder why the SAT has reduced the length of the test from three hours to under two hours. Hello? Because these companies need to stay in business. And students these days, they won't stand for a three-hour test anymore. They'll simply opt out. And colleges will encourage this by maintaining their test-optional policies. This inability to concentrate over a long period of time is an existential threat for the survivability of the SAT and the ACT tests. And what we're talking about here is a very narrow part of the problem, which is the ability to focus on real academic work, work that takes concentration. What about the toll that these technologies are having on physical fitness, relationships, body image, wellness, social-emotional health? This is just the tip of the iceberg. There is an argument that these technologies are making the grunt work of looking up the definition of a word or figuring out a math problem by hand obsolete. Why waste time opening up a dictionary and flipping to the word or taking out a pencil and paper to figure out a math problem? It's so much easier just to ask Siri. Think about all the time this is freeing up. Think of all the great things you'll be able to do with all of this newfound time. Well, we see how this free time is being used up. We see it every day. Every moment that your child is awake, they are making use of every single second of free time. And they're doing it with their phones. And we all know that what they're consuming on their phones is often anything but educational, wholesome, or productive. What are we doing to ourselves? And so I'd like to end this very optimistic an uplifting episode with a challenge for your child. Let's call it the three-hour challenge. The challenge is to see how difficult it is to sit down in a room without your phone for three hours, working on something productive, something of significance. By the way, obviously, this also includes not having your laptop or your iPad to do all of those distracting things that you would have normally done on your phone. It's a total shutdown. If you're in 11th or 12th grade, it should be very easy to find something that deserves this type of attention. It could be reading a book for class, studying for the SAT or the ACT, taking a practice SAT or ACT, studying for an AP exam, creating your own LinkedIn profile, researching colleges, creating a brag sheet for teachers who will write your letters of recommendation, researching summer internship opportunities, getting ahead on creating a math cheat sheet for your upcoming exam, drafting your college essay, taking an online course. I could go on for days and days and days with ideas. The question is, can your child pull it off? If so, what did it feel like to concentrate on something for three hours? How difficult was it? What were they thinking as it was happening? What was going through their mind? Did they learn anything from this experience? Did they accomplish anything? Were they proud of what they accomplished? Do they now think that, wow, I got a lot done in that three hours and I was super efficient. Maybe I'll try this again. If they fail the challenge and they break out in hives without their phone or have a terrible time without it and they don't complete any type of productive work, what does that mean? And what might that mean for them going forward? Give this three-hour challenge a try and report back to me with the results. I'd love to hear how it goes for your family.
That's all I've got for you today, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the continued support. If you know a parent with a 6th, 7th, 8th grader, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grader in high school that might find this helpful, please share the episode with them. You can do that by finding that small box with a tiny arrow pointing up. That's the share button. Click that button. Text your friends a link to this episode with a little personal note from you recommending that they give it a listen. Give us a rating, too, if you like what you hear. Apparently, that helps our podcast reach a wider audience. Of course, if you have comments, questions, or an idea for an upcoming episode, please reach out to me by email, DM me on Instagram, check out our blog, Facebook page, connect with me on LinkedIn. I would love to hear from you. Until next week, goodbye, good luck, and never stop preparing. This podcast is brought to you by PrepWell Academy. Prepwell Academy is my one-of-a-kind online mentoring program that delivers to your 9th or 10th grader a short, highly relevant video from me every week, every Sunday in fact, where I give them a heads up about what they should be thinking about to stay ahead of the game. To get these valuable lessons into your child's hands, please head over to prepwellacademy.com and enroll your child today.